Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart. An annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion. part of Calgary life for more than a century. Long before they turned the Grey Cup game into a national celebration, Calgary's football fans cheered for the Tigers, the 50th Battalion, and the Altomas. In 1938, the Calgary Bronx were the most powerful team in the West. During the Second World War, football was on hold. But in 1945, the game returned to Calgary when the Stampeders first took to the field. Three years later, playing coach Les Lear signed a local Chinese-Canadian running back, Normie Kwong. I had just uh, finished a junior uh, campaign in which I was the most valuable player for, the, for my team, so I thought I had a fair shot at it. I always felt I could hold my own on the field, and uh, I always really wanted to play. I was so young that I, I, I guess I was too, too dumb to be intimidated. After recording the only undefeated season in league history, the 1948 Stampeders captured the West. Heading to Toronto for the Grey Cup game, coach Les Lear made certain that the team remained in top shape. We went down on the train and uh, Les Lear was such a stickler on conditioning that every time there was a stop, the players had to go out and run around the train. And if there was a half hour stop, we used to have to get out, put on our sweats and run around the train. I don't think Toronto had ever seen anything like the Calgary Stampeders coming east. Uh, they brought their chuck wagons, they had horses parading through hotel lobbies. It gave it another dimension. Facing the Ottawa Rough Riders, the Stampeders ran the ball effectively, but it was their trademark aerial attack led by star quarterback Keith Spaeth and receivers Woody Strode and Normie Hill that made the difference in their 12-7 victory. With their first Grey Cup in franchise history, the Stampeders and their fans celebrated all the way home. The train ride back was a continuous four-day party. Went on from day and night. There was one, uh, one of the cars was a empty, just a freight car, I guess, and they used it, the band used to play in there. They had a Western band, and people would be dancing, and every time we stopped on the train, there were fans out, even in the middle of the night, to uh, greet the team because they knew the, the team was coming through at that point. As the Stampeders celebrated, Les Lear and Woody Strode made a trip to Hollywood to visit Strode's former teammates and now actor, Ezra Sugarfoot Anderson. I was working in the picture with Paul Douglas and uh, Linda Donnell. Everybody does it. And here this... Uh, Doors open to the studio, and this big, tall, black guy walks in with a short, white guy. And I says, who in the heck is this? Lear and Strode convinced Sugarfoot to resume his football career in Canada. Before he left, his mother decided to do a little research. She says, I can't find anything on Canada in the library, but uh, it's a lot of Indians, and... Uh, Royal Monty police, and that's it. She kind of feared 
that I was going into rough territory. The defending champion Stampeders returned to the Grey Cup in 1949, but this time they were outgunned. Flinging Frankie Filchuk and the Montreal Alouettes captured a 28-15 victory, but the loss did little to dampen the spirits of the Calgary contingent. We rode that train coming back from the Grey Cup, but I loved it. We had a bar car, we had a dance car, and we just had a ball coming back on the train. For the Stampeders, the 50s began with a huge mistake. They decided they could do without Normie Kwan. I had been out for about a month and uh, was an ankle that wouldn't go down, wouldn't, wouldn't, didn't seem to want to heal. And my father took me to Chinatown into one of the back rooms in one of the stores. And the fellow there wanted to give me a shot of whiskey and uh, put this poultice on my ankle, which he did. And I was playing the next week. But uh, I think uh, Calgary was a little suspicious, and I believe there was a doctor. I heard later on that there was a doctor that told him that I would never play again. And so they were quite happy to trade me to Edmonton. In 1960, the Stampeders signed Lavelle Coleman, a back who brought both power and speed to the Calgary offense. A year later, they had his equivalent on defense, a soft-spoken, hard-hitting linebacker, Wayne Thumper Harris. I knew I could play pro when I come out of college. It's just a matter of where I would be going. And I didn't know at that time where I'd be going. I was drafted by Boston Patriots. But when I came out of college, I was only 185 pounds. And uh, no one at that time were looking at 185 pound linebackers. Wayne Harris from the Calgary Stampeders was, without question, to me, the most difficult guy to block in football. Uh, Wayne was not that big, he was extremely quick, and he would never, ever let an offensive lineman get a full piece on him. Wayne Harris certainly was the best football player that I think the Stampeders have ever had. Uh, I say that without reservation, but I can go one step further. Of all my years, I think I played and coached 39 years and managed and so forth all those times. Uh, and he's the best football player I've ever been associated with. During the 60s, Calgary's McMahon Stadium was home to another great warrior, tackle Don Luzzi. When I first came to Calgary, he played both offense and defense. There was no such thing as uh, coming off after you played defense uh, for two plays and then coming on the sideline. You were in from the time the whistle blew at the beginning of the ball game to the time the whistle blew at the end of the ball game. In 1968, Calgary returned to the Grey Cup for the first time in 19 years. The Stampeders boasted a dangerous aerial attack led by quarterback Peter Lisk and Canadian receiver Terry Evansham. But that day, they ran into another great passer, Ottawa's Russ Jackson. Russ Jackson was his, at his best as, as a quarterback. So it's something that I look back on and say, Hey, I was there, but still didn't get my ring. So as I said, all I'm doing is suggesting that size 14 finger, any of the players that have more than one great, great cup ring, and they decide they want to donate it to somebody, I'd wear it with honor. Two years later, in a sub-zero blizzard at Saskatchewan's Taylor Field, the Stampeders faced the Rough Riders in the deciding game of the Western Final. Trailing by two points in the dying seconds of the game, Stampeder coach Jim Duncan turned to place kicker Larry Robinson. Duncan came over and said, uh, okay, go kick it. And I thought to myself, why me? It was the worst weather I've ever played in in my life. Even uh, as a kid, I wouldn't go outside. I don't think it was so cold. And the snow was just going straight. The wind was 40 mile an hour against us. They are going into a wind that it is unbelievable there. I, I think they were only on about the 28 yard line or something like that. But anyway, I didn't even think they would try the kick because I didn't think anybody in the world could make a field goal from there. I hit the ball real well and it was going, going, going. And I thought I aimed too wide because uh, I, I thought I was gonna miss it because it was still way outside the post. All of a sudden, uh, I, there must've been an extra gust of wind or something. It just died and did a left turn fell over the goalpost, and uh, 
I don't believe it to this day that it went, you know, that it went through, but it did. Robinson's heroics took the third place Stampeders to Toronto for the 1970 Grey Cup against Montreal. Poorly laid sod left the field in ruins as the Stampeders fell to the Alouettes 23-10. Calgary returned to the final the following year on a rain-soaked field in Vancouver's Empire Stadium the Western champion Stampeders battled the Toronto Argonauts. Late in the game, the Stampeders were leading by three when an interception put the Argos in scoring position. I sent in a play, I said, uh, uh, we'll run a sweep to the left, and if it uh, opens up, take it, and, uh, but uh, if it doesn't open up, make sure you get in front of the goal post because if the worst comes to the worst, we'll tie them and, and beat them with our kicking game. The slippery turf caused Toronto running back Leon McQuay to lose his footing and the football. The Stampeders recovered and held on for the victory. Even if McQuay had kept the ball, all they could have done was tied. And you got to remember, our defense dominated that game. They only made two first downs the second half. They only scored one touchdown in the game, and that was on a fumble. I'm disappointed at times that people realize that it's McQuay fumble that caused us to win. Our football team caused us to win. Any football player who starts out in the first of the season, that's your ult ultimate challenge is to win a championship. That was a veteran team, and a lot of guys have been waiting for a lot of years to win a game like that. But it was a great victory for us. We'd been there twice before and lost, and it's not a very nice feeling. Uh, so when we won it, it was just, uh, it was bedlam, it was crazy. Everybody just went wild. and. Uh, you say finally to win one, it was, uh, I was on a high for three weeks, I think, before I came down. Through the 70s, the Stampeders saw little team success, but Calgary fans retreated to highlight real performances from running back Willie Burton, the league's most outstanding player for 1975, and defensive all-star John Helton, who was twice named the game's top defensive player. John Helton could stuff the run, he could rush the passer on a screenplay, and still run downfield and keep it for like a two-yard gain. He was an amazing athlete at defense. I don't think there's many defensive tackles nowadays that had all those skills. John Helton was a clean, hard-nosed, football player that when that game was on did everything he could to win but John Helton was also a guy that when the game was over would come up congratulate you want to know if you'd want to go fishing when the ball was in the air the Stampeders relied on a Canadian receiver who was the third member of his family to wear Calgary colors hometown hero Tom Forzani well Tom Forzani is uh, he, he was uh, he's a tough guy Mentally tough and everything like that, so uh, he could get open and catch the ball in, in any kind of condition. What I would try to do, and I, I think I did a pretty good job of it, would I would eliminate the other players on the other team by the concentration on the football and the football only. Because if your ever, mind ever wandered, then uh, your opportunity or your chances of catching that football greatly decreased. For the Stampeders, playoff appearances were rare and the Grey Cup a distant dream. But for Calgary fans, any season could be rescued by winning two games. The gang wars with the Edmonton Eskimos, known simply as the Battle of Alberta. The Battle of Alberta, you know, if, if you go back through history, you could have uh, the Eskimos uh, you know, winning Grey Cups in Calgary at the very bottom of the league, but uh, Labor Day, all bets are off. It's just a different game than any other game in Canadian football. The Battle of Alberta is uh, in all sports between Edmonton and Calgary. Uh, hockey, football, baseball, anything that goes on. And we hated them uh, worse than anybody. But uh, in the 60s, we were lucky enough that we beat the crap out of them most of the time. There's no question that there was just a little bit more nerves and just a little bit more sincerity. It was serious, get down, dirty, hard-nosed fight. I always remember going down there on Labor Day and playing against them and 
being in the hotel the night before the game and their their crowd would be outside of our hotel trying to keep us up all night ranting and raving and screaming in in the night and anything they could do to disrupt us it was a, it was a tremendous rivalry Edmonton and Calgary whole day hated each other I didn't know two cities that close could really hate each other that much like if I went to Ed, if I went to Calgary and I wore some Edmonton Eskimo stuff god people swear at me cursed at me it was terrible through the 80s, the Eskimos dominated the Stampeders. In 1990, Wally Buono took over as head coach. His top priority, winning the Battle of Alberta. They had been, I guess, uh, so much in the shadows of the Eskimos uh, that they didn't believe that they, they could ever be better than the Eskimos. And I think because of that, uh, there was always that, you know, inferiority. That was something that, uh, you know, we felt or I felt that had to change. That year, Wano took the Stampeders to the top of the West, and the following season, they defeated the Eskimos to earn their first Grey Cup trip in 20 years. The game would be a learning experience for the Stampeders as they fell to the powerful Toronto Argonauts 36-21. The following season, the Stampeders signed a superstar, quarterback Doug Flutie. When we got Doug Flutie to come in with what we felt to be already a very good football club, uh, you know, we, we knew uh, going into training camp uh, that we were going to be a great cup champion. And Doug had never won a, a national championship, so he was hungry too. Among an outstanding group of receivers, Flutie found a favorite, the incomparable Alan Pitts. He was the most dominant receiver I've ever played with. He could dominate a game. When he was getting going good and you were leaning on him to throw the ball and we needed big plays, he had the ability to put a move on a guy and break away, and he put the ball up there and let him go make a play. In the 1992 Grey Cup game, Flutie and the Stampeders took to the field to face the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Flutie wasted no time as he launched an immediate aerial assault. We put on an exhibition throwing the football against Winnipeg in that, that Grey Cup, and it was just enjoyable. It really felt like we could do anything we wanted. The Stampeders scored on four of their first five offensive drives as they cruised to a 24-10 victory that made Doug Flutie a Grey Cup champion. It was my first championship, and uh, people in the States ask me you know, what the highlight of my career has been so far and all that. And Yeah, some of the things that happened in college and the Heisman Trophy and all, but um, and I've had a lot of great memories in the NFL now, but that was my first championship. And, and that 92 championship meant a lot to me. After two Western final defeats and a 1995 Grey Cup loss to Baltimore, it was the end of an era in Calgary as Doug Flutie left for Toronto. In 1998, Calgary was back in the championship against the Hamilton Tiger Cats. At the helm for the Stampeders, Jeff Garcia. Leading the Hamilton attack, quarterback Danny McManus. It was a classic Grey Cup battle. On their final drive, Calgary trailed by a single point. Jeff Garcia set the stage for a dramatic finish. Calgary just drove the ball all the way down the field. It looked um, with ease. Uh, Jeff Garcia was just unstoppable in that drive, throwing, running, doing whatever he wanted to, and then setting up Mark McLaughlin for a field goal that, you know, was going to go through. I felt pretty comfortable that, that Mark was going to step in there and make it, and, uh, you know, everything's happened so quickly that uh, when the ball went up, I saw the rotation, I knew he was going to have it, I, uh, and I put my hands in the air looking, looking for someone to jump on. Mark had already been, was running to the sideline uh, to, uh, to celebrate. You always want to win a championship, and it doesn't matter what level you're at, whether you're in junior high or, or playing in professional football. You're, you're, you're building and working for, for a championship, and by being in the league three years at that point, I, I realized how tough it was to get there, let alone win one, and you don't necessarily have a lot of players that win championships, and, and I've got my ring, and I'm, I'm happy to wear it. It was Dave Dickinson at the controls in the 1999 rematch with Hamilton. But Double D was not operating at full throttle. I was actually playing with, uh, with a broken bone on my left shoulder, and also I was dislocating in the left shoulder. So I was having a tough time uh, 
functioning out there, but I wasn't going to miss it. And, and it, it could be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to start and play in that great cup. I wanted to give it everything I had. Dickinson performed well, but the Stamps had no answer for Hamilton's McManus to Flutie combination, and Calgary fell 32-21. In 2001, Calgary had another new face at quarterback, Marcus Crandall. Although the Stampeders were blessed with talent, they struggled to find their form. The first half of the season was not very much fun and uh, was not very successful. And, uh, you know, the second half things started to, uh, you know, fall into place. And I guess there was a point in time, um, you know, where the veterans got together and they took ownership of the football club and they sacrificed their own individualism to become a football team. And we were not a football team prior to that. A strong finish carried Calgary through the playoffs and onto the Grey Cup at Montreal's Olympic Stadium, where they faced the highly favored Winnipeg Blue Bombers. We felt uh, that we matched up well against them. I, I think the coaches, uh, you know, uh, got the players to believe that we could do the things we needed to do to, to win. Were we the best skilled team? Probably not. Okay, we, 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 you know, we were focused at that time. We wanted to win, and uh, we had enough good players that we could win. In an MVP performance, Calgary quarterback Marcus Crandall threw two touchdown passes to lead the Stampeders to a 27-19 upset victory over Winnipeg. And Calgary celebrated its second Grey Cup championship in four years. That was a tough year. But uh, we gelled together as a team at the end, and, uh, and we achieved our goal. And that's just the best, that's the best feeling in the world, to be a champion and um, to say you're the champion of, of the um, CFL for that year. No one can take that from you. So it's a great feeling, and, um, and uh, nobody want to be number two. They always want to be number one. The Calgary Stampeders 2001 Grey Cup celebration continued a tradition born in 1948. When a train trip east turned a simple game of football, into a nationwide obsession. Calgary is uh, the place that really got the Canadian Football League well established back in the Grey Cup of 1948 when they went down to Toronto and really put on a performance. And to this day, that tradition lives. Uh, it's a big entertaining event that brings Canada together and to make it, you know, the people proud to be Canadians and proud to support the Canadian Football League.